The first area we're going to look at is biology. If you're familiar with this section, you may wish to fast forward to the chemistry or the physics sections. The biology sections are split into three units, so we'll kick off with feeding relationships in food webs. This unit is split into three main sections, energy in food webs, population size and toxic materials in food webs. Let's start with energy in food webs. First of all, we will briefly run through what you should already know about food chains. In a nutshell, food chains show in any particular habitat what is eaten by what. Now, this fish tank represents a typical habitat, a rather murky garden, but still teeming with organisms. And one food chain here could start with waterweed, which is eaten by tadpoles, which in turn would be eaten by larger carnivores, water beetles and fish such as minnows. And remember, in a food chain, the arrows always go from food to feeder. So in this case, from waterweed to tadpoles to minnows. Now, in a test, you will often get diagrams like this. Basically, the food chain has become a lot more complicated, and this is now called a food web. The same principle applies. The arrows go from food to feeder. But here, we have added water beetles, perch, then pike, and top carnivores, otters. These arrows also represent the direction of energy flow through a habitat. And as you go up a particular food chain, the number of organisms decreases. So if we look at another food chain, we can start with leaves that are eaten by caterpillars and then woodpeckers. And finally, the top carnivore is one kestrel. As we go up the food chain, the number of organisms goes down. Now, why is this? Well, it's to do with energy. There are fewer organisms as we go up a particular food chain because the energy flow along a food chain is very inefficient. But how much is passed on? But if we use this spot of sunlight to represent the sun's light energy shining on a green plant, how much does the plant manage to convert to stored food energy? 66%. 33%. In fact, this 0.2%. Only one five hundredth of the sun's light energy is transferred to the start of a food chain. So if all the energy that's stored in the plant and is available to the animals that eat it is represented by this light, how much is transferred to that animal? 90%? 50%? No, the amount of energy transferred to the animals is around 10%. But what happens to the 90% that isn't? Well, it's not available to the food chain because it's the energy the plant needs each and every day to survive. And it's the energy that drives all the reactions to make new cells, which in turn produces leaves, flowers and seeds. In fact, all levels of the food chain transfer 10% of the energy they receive onto the next level. So 90% of energy is lost from food chains, but it does keep everything alive. Here are some facts about food chains you really need to know well in order to answer test questions. So for food chains, the arrows always go from food to feeder, not the other way round. The arrows also represent the energy flow along a food chain and the amount of usable energy decreases as we go up a food chain. And because the energy transfer is very inefficient, the number of organisms it can support decreases as you go along a food chain. The energy in any food chain originally comes from the sun and is converted into biomass by photosynthesis. So, to sum up this section, feeding relationships in a habitat can be summarised using a food web. If you weren't sure of anything, rewind the tape and go over the key points again. The next section in this unit looks at population size. 
Population size is how many of one particular type of plant or animal there is in a habitat. But the population of a particular organism doesn't just keep on rising. In fact, sometimes something happens and the population, rather than rising, goes into freefall and starts declining. In the next clip, try and note down the factors that are affecting the size of the barn owl population. Barn owls like this are under threat. They're not producing enough young to keep the species going. I'm here to investigate what's being done about it. So why aren't barn owls producing enough young? Well, to understand that, we've got to look at the chain. OK. At the bottom, you've got grass, and that's eaten by small mammals like voles and mice. And the voles and mice are, in turn, eaten by the barn owls. Yes, but it's the number of small mammals that's so important. Right, because the number of small mammals will directly control the number of owls that can live in a given area. Exactly. So why is there such a shortage of small mammals? I mean, there's hardly a shortage of grass. It's everywhere. Yes, but it's not the quantity, it's the quality of rough grass. If we look at this area here, it's all short, close-cropped, well-grazed, and voles can't make their nests, they can't make their runs, and they can't hide. So as this grass is too short for small mammals to live in, it means there's not enough food for owls. So the owls won't breed. Yes, they won't breed and the species will die out. So what the owls need to do is move to an area where hunting can be made more efficient. Well, somewhere suitable for small mammals. Yes, come on, I'll show you. I guess that means grassland that would give them good cover. Meadow is excellent because there's this rough tussocky grassland here. Well, I'm sure if we look hard we might find... Vole run. Yeah, here we are. Here, look. Here's a vole run, and in here are the small clippings of grass, which is their food store. So this area is alive with small mammals. Collins put an owl box here, as there are no natural nesting places in the area. These are young owls, which shows the parents are breeding. They're checked to make sure they're growing into healthy adults. It won't be long before they fly off for good, and soon they'll be starting families of their own to continue the species. So, have you noted down the two factors here that are affecting the size of the barn owl population? You should have found that the owl population is decreasing because of a lack of food supply. The habitat of the small mammals they feed on is disappearing and there were few suitable nesting places, so artificial owl boxes have been put up. The size of a population is controlled by three major factors. Adaptation, competition from other species for food, water and shelter, and predation. That's being eaten as food by animals further up the food chain. A tip on remembering these things is to draw a triangle and put the population size in the middle. The three controlling factors are added to the sides. Adaptation, competition and predation. Now predators themselves are affected by these things, particularly their own food supply, their prey. But how? This is a classic example of a predator-prey cycle. If the hare population increases, this supplies more food for the lynx, the predator. This in an increase in the lynx population. However, more lynx results in less hares, which in time results in less lynx again. These fluctuating population sizes are typical of lots of predator-prey relationships. The population size of any species is controlled by three main factors. Adaptation, how well the species is suited to its environment. Competition, how successful are the species competing with other species for the same resources, food, water or shelter? Predation, how predators affect the size of the population and how many there are. Remember, in the last section we showed you this food web in a typical British river. The question is, what happen if the minnows were removed? Three things will happen, so three marks have been awarded for this answer. Why not pause the tape and have a think about it?
Well, if the minnows were removed from this food web, three things would happen. One, the tadpoles won't get eaten, so their numbers will increase. Two, water beetles will get eaten more by hungry perch who haven't got minnows to feast on. And three, the water weed will diminish since the number of tadpoles will increase. The relationships in these food webs can get quite complicated. If you weren't sure of the answer, why not rewind and go over this section again? If you're happy to carry on, let's find out what happens when toxic materials enter a food web. Another factor that affects the size of populations is the activity of humans, either by producing pollution or by leaving toxic substances in the environment. Sometimes these toxic, poisonous substances get into and are passed along a food chain. The plants and animals near the start of a food chain are usually unharmed by the relatively low concentrations of poison. But as it passes along the chain, it becomes more concentrated, so the animals at the top of the chain take in large amounts of the poison, which their bodies can't get rid of. And this is exactly what happened to some animals and birds. In the 1960s, seeds were often dipped in pesticide to protect them from pests. Some birds of prey, like the peregrine falcons, which are top carnivores at the top of the food chain, started dying out. Their bodies had large amounts of pesticides. One of the side effects was that the newly laid eggs had thin shells which would easily break before the chicks were ready to hatch. Now these pesticides are banned and peregrine falcons are increasing in numbers again.